Thank you all for coming and sharing this with us. I, I, uh, I might have a bit of a lower energy level because I've, I've been now, after four days of vacationing in Maui, they've dragged me over to, what, 25 meetings in the last 48 hours or something like that? We've been going from one meeting to, to another, and it's been the most amazing welcome that we've had here. And I want to thank every one of you who has been part of it to um, really giving us this kind of, of open arms welcome to better place. The team up to date. We've been here quietly for the last five, six months. Pete has, has been doing a tremendous job in, in getting engaged and getting us to understand the lay of the land uh, and how not to do it, uh, which is, I understood very quickly is more important than how to do it. Um, so we, we've been um, very careful, very engaged, and we're learning. Um, we are not, we're here to, to stay. So we're here to make this happen. We've very early on in our process, and I, this goes back to my, my original white paper. I don't know how many of you know um, the, the background on, on how this whole happened. Uh, I'll give you sort of a, a, a brief history. I'm, I'm a, a young entrepreneur at, at, uh, at 22. I was blessed already to uh, start four companies with my dad. Um, I recruited my dad out of a large corporation and told him we were going to do some big things. And uh, we built four companies. And I was lucky at the age of 30 to sell one of those companies um, to a large company that paid a lot of money. And then I was, uh, I don't know how it happened, but three years later I sold it again legally to another company. Because, <laughs> um, uh, and, and that company was SAP, the third largest software company in the world. And, uh, and I was asked to stay at SAP. and. You know, sort of gotten into, I call it retail, because every year they came in and said, can you do something bigger? And they gave me less money for it. And, uh, <laughs> and in 2005, I was asked to, to be the next CEO at SAP. And um, I said yes. Because, I, I, you know, for somebody who grew up, I, I was programming since the age of seven. That was the pinnacle of the dreams. You, you know, be a CEO of one of the large, three large companies in, in the business you grew up in is the best thing you can dream of. Um, I also got asked the question, I joined the World Economic Forum on that year, and I got asked the question by the founder of the, the forum, how do you make the world a better place by 2020? Now, I think he meant it as a conversational starter. I actually took it seriously, and I came up with this crazy notion that if, if we could figure out a model by which we run one country without oil, using the knowledge, the science, the technology we have today on the shelf, using the economics we know, not ignoring physics and not ignoring economics, in a way that can scale up, that can be copied by every country around the world, we make the world a better place. I didn't start as an environmentalist. I actually saw Al Gore a couple of months later. That got me to be an environmentalist because I figured out it's not about saving lizards. It's actually about saving my kids. But it started off because I grew up in Israel and I, I know the destructive power of oil on peace in the Middle East. And so I, I thought if we could find a way to lend the price of oil calmly over 10, 15 years, we can actually create modernization um, in the Middle East. We can create democracy. And we can bring more harmony into, into the relationships in the Middle East. And that was the, the, sort of the starting point of my thought. Um, and I didn't know how to do it. I, I'm not a car guy. Not an oil guy, not an energy guy, um, but it was like a puzzle. And I played around with that puzzle for quite some time uh, in my head until I realized if we made a convenient electric car, it's the answer for the inconvenient truth. And um, to make it convenient, you needed to change the fundamentals of the infrastructure. You know, if, if, uh, um, if you bought a lot of electric cars, who, was, who said that? If you buy a lot of electric cars and there's no infrastructure to drive them, why would you buy electric cars? We just talked about that, um, right? Um, makes, makes no sense. And put this whole framework together. And in the framework, we actually had um, a chapter that says, how do you start? And, and we said, we got to go to, trans to transformation. The transformation has to go through transportation islands. Because you can actually do this in islands in a way that scales. And we had the three, what we call the Atlantic Islands and the Pacific Islands. And the Atlantic Islands were Iceland, also known today as Waterworld after their economy melted, um, <laughs> Iceland, Israel, and the UK. And I know Israel 
doesn't look like an island on the map, but if your car, if, if an Israeli car is going outside Israel, it's been stolen. So <laughs> we, we have different boundaries. They're not water. They're actually more political or geopolitical mm -hmm. boundaries, but cars don't leave Israel. And we, we basically said, let's scale it up in that kind of an order. Hundreds of thousands of cars, millions of cars, tens of millions of cars, every time you scale by a factor of 10. And on the Pacific Rim, we said the, the, the match is Singapore, Hawaii, Japan. Same thing. Hundreds of thousands of cars, million, point two, and tens of millions. And when we started this, I handed out lots of papers to a lot of people, including some people in governments in those six locations. And uh, some of them said, it's great that the young generation is thinking about it, and they moved on. Some actually said, go do it. And the president of Israel, Shimon Peres, actually challenged me in return. And he said, if you believe you can do it, 